If the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. A project uh, called Bubble Pond, which is a very simple uh, A-Life project. I uh, conceived of this uh, last year, actually one of these uh, Griffin meetings, uh, and it's changed a lot since my original ideas. I was thinking of uh, trying to create an A-Life project that um, represents a membrane, like a circular membrane made up of individual cells and how they work together as a, um, a sort of a colony. Um, but in doing it, I ended up uh, just dealing with them individually. And um, my idea with this is to try to uh, work with some concepts that I haven't seen done in any other A-Life project and doing them, them in the most simple manner that I can that still produces interesting results mm. with the idea that other developers can make use of them or make use of concepts from it uh, in other projects. And uh, maybe this project will um, even uh, move on to, um, to cover more stuff as well. The basic concept of this, this isn't intended to uh, closely simulate any actual living organisms or any living environment, but um, try to represent uh, an evolving system uh, in, a, uh, in a very uh, simple environment. Uh, the basic environment is uh, a circular pond, and uh, it's Fortune bigger than the screen, so um, and it's a circular, circular environment, it, and um, its surface is two-dimensional uh, and is intended to be uh, frictionless. So it's kind of like an icy pond or something like that, with uh, uh, with these organisms sliding about frictionlessly on the surface. Um, the individual. Uh, critters or organisms on these, uh, I'm just calling bubbles, and they're these uh, circular organisms that slide about and they bounce off of each other and off the walls with elastic collisions, similar to um, billiard balls on a, a, a billiard table or uh, um, air hockey pucks bouncing mm. off of each other. Mm. Um, now, <coughs> they, uh, as individual agents, um, they have the ability to detect things within a certain range of them, and uh, that depends very much on their individual genetics. <coughs> but you can kind of see a faint circle around the outside perimeter of them, and that's their sensory zone. Um, and then they're only, they can't control their movement directly, but indirectly they can expand or contract based on stimuli and can add to our reduce the impact of their collisions. So they can actually just bouncing off the wall, if they expand just as they hit the wall, they will increase their speed uh, in the deflection. Huh. And um, <clears throat> each of these uh, bubbles has a set of uh, 20 genetic values that represent different factors. And each of these genetic values is uh, represented as a floating point value between zero and one. And, um, and let me start a, a new batch here. Do you, well, yeah, to give you an idea, um, the batch starts off with uh, 20 of these organisms with uh, random genetic values and moving in random um, velocities, speed and direction. Let me start that real quick here. Okay. So, throughout here, there's uh, 20 organisms. Now, most of them don't have the genetic capability to survive. Also, it starts off with a certain amount of uh, drop food, which are these green dots. These are food that um, are, um, are basically coming from outside of the pool, and, or the pond, and uh, are dropped in, and they contain a certain amount of energy. And uh, there's a certain amount that they start with, and then um, every second 
or so, a new um, bit of food is dropped at a random location in the pond, and it and it just continuously uh, does so. Now, these uh, bubbles. Uh, let, let me say they, they have four uh, states, uh, four modes that they can be in. Uh, one, which is at the very beginning, they have a green um, border, and that is their embryonic mode. Huh. And they start off at a single point, and then they grow to a certain size determined by their genetics, and then they, their, um, their outside membrane turns blue, and uh, they go into their normal mode, like you see here. And then in the normal mode, they will expand and contract between two diameters uh, at a rate determined by their genetics and at a diameters, set of diameters determined by genetics. Then they'll also expand or contract based on sensory stimulus. And that's also depending on their genetics, uh, what that change is and what they react to. Um, let's see here. Let me start them off. Um, Again, so you can see them in the embryonic stage. How did, how did that giant one that was just floating by there get to be so big? Uh, its genetics give it a value of, of a very large size in its normal mode. Um, so it started out big, big well, baby? They start off as little points and they grow to the size of their genetics, say, that should be their bounded. When they collide with each other, they are considered to be the same mass. So they may have a different diameters, but they'll bounce off of each other so they were both one unit of mass. See that one's very large. Um, now, they have an internal energy state. Um, and when that energy state uh, goes down to zero, they will go into dying mode, which their outside turns gray, as this one does. And they will slowly um, decompose, uh, reduce back to a single point. Um, but they can be bouncing, they won't eat, they won't uh, reproduce, uh, unlike some organisms, uh, when they're dead, <laughs> uh, when they're in dying mode. But they can't be bounced against, you know, and, and they're part of the system and that kind of stuff. And eventually it'll go down to a single point and it will leave a single red dot behind. And this is carrion food. So we have green drop food and then red carrion food, and that one will, yeah, leave a what single dot. Carrion? Uh, that's basically the dead remains of uh, one of these bubbles. And if a bubble, another bubble has the capability of consuming carrion food, then as they pass over it, they can eat it. I just don't know this term. The term? Carrion. Carrion, uh, that is like um, in the savannah of Africa is when an uh, animal dies, there'll be these scavengers like vultures and stuff that eat off. They, they eat carrion. That's it's what they the refer dead. to as a dead, the dead body the dead body that other animal scavengers feed off of. Yeah. Uh, and, and the fourth mode is um, sexual reproduction mode. And not every um, every bubble has the genetic capability, because it's something they kind of have to evolve or have the genetic capability of, to, uh, to, have, uh, to be able to go into a sexual reproduction mode. But when they do, they will have a red border and when they collide with another bubble that is also in sexual reproduction mode, then they will produce a child uh, at the collision point, actually. <laughs> so that's uh, those are the, the four modes that it are. And what about the three dots that they seem to be leaving behind? Certain ones seem to be leaving behind in their way. I'll, I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Uh, sure. Oh, sure. Two, two, two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some conservations? Uh, basically, loads. food is being brought in from the outside with these green food, right? Uh -huh. Now, when they when they pass, if if they have the capability of consuming green food, and uh, their digestive system is shown on uh, the outside, uh, just inside the the outer uh, perimeter here, the outer membrane, green uh, bar here shows that they can. Uh, this one can consume green food. It's dying right now. So if it were to pass over green food, it would actually consume it. Now, the bubbles have um, an internal digestive tract that over a period of time, uh, five seconds actually, they will digest the food and extract energy from the green food that they will be able to use. And then after that five seconds, depending, wow, I'm going crazy here. Uh, <laughs> depending on the efficiency of uh, 
of their. It's, uh, it's a bubble. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, they'll. It'd be quad core. Enough of them will die out. It'll come back down to normal. But depending on the efficiency of their digestive system, they will leave behind a bit of dung uh, afterwards. Dung. Yes, dung. Uh, and other bubbles, if they have the capability of consuming dung, when they pass over the dung, can consume that and bring that through their digestive system. And um, depending on their efficiency, dung can be consumed and energy taken from it, and then expelled, and then consumed again several times until eventually it runs out. And the, uh, the color of the dung is actually shows how much um, energy there is remaining on it. If it's uh, black, it um, doesn't have much energy, but if it's light brown, it, and that one just got consumed, it has uh, a lot of energy left in it. So, um, and then when one of these organisms dies, uh, like this one right here, it'll leave a red bit of carrion. And if they have the ability to uh, eat carrion food, then they can consume that, bring it through their digestive system, and then leave dung behind from that as well. Huh. So the three outer bars, not, not the uh, membrane, but these show the efficiency of this particular bubble at eating different types of food. And their genetics determine it. Um, basically, the, they have a separate gene value for each type of, of these three types of food. If their gene value is above 0.5, then they can consume that food, and they have a bar. And then the value between 0.5 and 1 of the gene uh, sh shows the efficiency that they can digest that food. Um, so they might have very small bars, which means they're not very efficient. They can consume it, but they won't be able to extract much energy from it. Are those variables? Can they change depending on? Uh, not during the lifetime, but they are mm -hmm. gene values, so they get passed on. Huh when they reproduce. Um, yeah, and, th and they vary the size and the size is dependent. Uh, if it goes into s a s sexual reproduction mode, it can actually change its, uh, its um, the size it tends to vary between. So it's, it's like a completely different mode for it. So now you would think, well, they would evolve to have all three types of, you know, ability to consume all three types of food at maximum efficiency. But the problem with that is that um, they metabolize energy over time and will actually um, expend energy. And various factors will determine the rate that they expend energy. One is uh, their actual, actual diameter and the rate of change as they move, uh, as they expand and contract. Um, and that, the, the larger they are and the, the faster they expand and contract, the more energy they will expend over time. And also, if uh, the more they're capable of digesting, the more advanced their digestive tract in these three uh, types of food, uh, the faster, the, the, the more energy they will expand over a given period of time. So it, it might make sense for one of them to specialize in one type of food, or be a generalist and only, you know, be able to um, to uh, digest so much of each type of food, or if there's a lot of food available of all different types to, to be, you know, um, have a, the best uh, digestive capability for all three types of food. So systems might evolve uh, organisms that are successful that can just eat one type of food or, um, or not. Depends on, the, um, on what the environment has. Okay, let's see. Um, when they're in embryonic mode, they will they don't expend energy. They don't um, uh, consume food when they're in the green mode, and <coughs> you know they uh, can't be reproduced with. Uh, they will grow up to their um, normal size uh, and then will go into their normal mode. Now, <coughs> the uh, center dot or the center circle on here, which is yellow, are black sometimes. This shows how much energy they have internally at a given time. If it's bright yellow, that means they have kind of uh, a large amount of energy. And if it's uh, black that or, or darker yellow, that means um, they have less energy. And if it's completely black, then uh, they have zero energy left and they will be going into dying mode if they aren't already. Uh, let's see. So um, when... A new organism is born. 
uh, it has no momentum, no velocity at the start. So it depends on the community, someone to bounce into it basically uh, and get it moving for it to be able to consume food. Otherwise it'll just stay there and eventually it'll just expend energy and then die. Now, uh, there are two forms of reproduction uh, that these bulbs can do, uh, sexual and asexual. And uh, these are based on its genes. It can have either turned on or either turned off. It can have both or, or neither. Um, and these are represented um, as these um, purple and pink um, half circles near the inside, right next to the yellow inner circle. And uh, the purple one on the right uh, represents uh, asexual uh, reproduction, and then the pink one on the left represents sexual. And uh, the idea is that they have a threshold for each of those. When, as they gain more energy, um, it will uh, light up here, and when it gets to the very top, then um, they will on the right side, they will asexually reproduce. Mm -hmm. And when they reproduce, as, as the simulation currently has, um, they will uh, basically have uh, two sets of their genes passed on to the child, and then one random set, uh, randomly determined. So there's a certain randomization in the child's genetics. Um, but otherwise, it's mostly the, the parents. and. Uh, since it takes a certain amount of energy to produce a child that will be extracted from the parent, and then they have a gene that will determine how much additional energy they will provide to the child. The, uh, the baseline just is enough for the child to reach adulthood, but they won't have energy, any energy left. They would immediately die, uh, go into dying mode. But uh, the additional energy that the organism um, provides based on their genes to the, to the child will allow it to continue for a certain amount of time before eating as an adult. So an organism might be able to uh, uh, provide a huge amount of energy to the child, but that means it'll be a long time before they build up enough energy to produce another child. So they won't, be, they won't asexually be producing so many children. Um, or they can produce a lot of child and give them very little energy, which means that most of the children won't survive, but perhaps, you know, there'll, there'll be enough that they'll be able to. And then with sexual reproduction, um, of course it requires that they bounce into uh, another organism that's in sexual reproduction mode. Now that also has a threshold, so that once they get above a certain amount of energy, they can go into sexual reproduction mode. Um, to child, uh, they're basically able to share the energy uh, costs of producing the child with the other bubble that they've impacted. Uh, so it only costs them uh, basically half as much as they would um, to reproduce uh, asexually. And also the genes, they basically have one set from one of the parents, one set from the other, and then a third ran randomly determined set that's produced in the child. So each child can have a random mutation. Later, one, one thing I'd like to improve on the project is to have a set of slider bars that the user will be able to uh, set how random uh, the genetics of the offspring will be. Will they be completely random? Will they be not random at all or anywhere in between? Um, so let's see. Um, uh, that's um, mostly it. Uh, another uh, metabolic cost is the, um, the sensor range that they have that they can react to things. Um, with a, a higher sensor range, they can, of course, react to things easier, but um, it's more costly uh, in energy per second to it. So it might not be worth it to have a very large range. So. And this is, this, uh, these organisms, because they bounce off each other and they require that to, to keep moving around and to be able to find food, um, they're very dependent upon the rest of the community. Uh, if it was just by itself, it would have a much harder time um, maintaining its energy, uh, maintaining its speed and be able to collect food. Um, 
What are they sense? That's about it at the moment. Uh, uh, what are they sense? They, they, depending on their genes, uh, because the, they have <laughs> genes based on different sensory inputs. One is impacting the wall. Do they expand or contract as they um, uh, hit the wall? Uh, another is food that they can consume. They have the digestive system. If it's within their sensory range, do they expand or do they contract when they come close to that food? And how much do they expand or contract? Also, if um, they come across another bubble, do they expand or contract? And um, if they come across a sexually uh, reproductive uh, bubble, do they expand or contract? And then, if there's multiple sensory inputs, it, it, it basically uh, adds them all together for its uh, behavior. Was there anything you were hoping to observe uh, when you designed Bubble Pond? Um, I, was, I basically wanted to see if I can get a system that would stabilize, that um, the group could uh, balance out numbers to the amount of food available, and you would see them specialize to different types of food. Mm. There's basically three different types of food, carrion, dung, and uh, drop food. And, um, and to see how they uh, react to that, how, how they uh, establish a system of some eating one type of food and providing dung for another type, you know. And would there be any that specialize in scavenging off of carrion? Mm. Or is that really worth it, you know? Mm. Um, one thing I did observe that I didn't realize is that um, uh, originally, I did not have any kind of uh, age limit. Um, mm -hmm. Organisms that could survive but not reproduce were often the most successful ones because they didn't have to put any energy expenditure into reproduction. Mm -hmm. So they could just survive and, you know, and eat and, and do quite well that way and compete. And eventually enough of them, <coughs> there would be enough mutations, you know, on an offspring that there would be enough that could not reproduce and would be very good at surviving, that they would basically um, uh, take over and outcompete all the ones that were reproducing, and eventually the whole line would just peter out, and all you'd have left is these non-reproducing ones kind of in this static system. Mm -hmm. So I added an age limit of, I think, like a minute and a half or something, which gives them enough time to, you know, to uh, do whatever they need to do with reproduction and survival. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Overall, the system I think has uh, um, gone the other way, and there's very few, you see very few of them that are just you know mm. um, non-reproductive. Mm. Um, I also don't know if uh, the amount of randomization I have in the offspring's genes is too much right now. That not enough of the parents get brought to the offspring, and that they're they're just a little bit too random. But of the initial set of 20 completely random ones that I start out with, um, usually only about five to seven of them survive and continue. Mm. Uh, most of them die out pretty quickly. Mm. So, and I also, I found these to be extremely stable. It's rare that I see an initial batch that dies out completely. Mm. And uh, once they get going, they, they seem to be able to do it pretty much indefinitely. They go through this period early on where they overpopulate mm. and there's not enough food, but because um, because they have both the embryonic mode where they don't expend or consume food, and then they have the dying mode where they also don't, but they're just slowly you know, collapsing and degrading down, that the whole pool tends to get overwhelmed you know, with a huge number of them and they're mm. kind of pushing each other around. But eventually that balances out and you, you end up with a, a group uh, like this where you, there will always be some dying and always be some young ones, you know, oh. um, coming yeah. about. So this will stay stable for a long time? Yeah. I, I need to create like a graph um, plot that shows the population mm -hmm. versus... Yeah, I saw that area yeah. where there are lot, lots of large ones for a while. Was that that earlier phase you are talking yeah. about? Uh, yeah, and they have a, quite a wide range of them. Because yeah. there's a advantage of being large in that you can uh, uh, come across food more easily because mm. you're, you have a, a, a large diameter. Um, but it also has the energy, you know, metabolic energy expenditure. So um, there's a point where they kind of balance out on, on size. Mm. But you'll always see some oddities because there's quite a bit of mutation, uh, random mutation in the system. So uh, uh, what can each one of them control? Each one of them basically controls the expanding and contracting. Okay. And they can but not the direction of the movement. Right, exactly. Just um, 
the, the original set of 20 have random uh, speed and direction within you know certain bounded ranges uh, and random location starting location and then all the all the children you know after that don't have any momentum to start with don't, they don't have any velocity so they depend upon other things other um, bubbles bouncing into them to get them going so when they come up to a wall they can expand it and actually increase their speed moving off of it uh, or they can contract and slow and you, down. And you said that they can sense something in their environment? Yeah, within the range of these, um, of that kind of faint outer circle. And the, the longer... So it's the very larger, limited. The larger the sensor range, the more metabolic cost it is on the organism. Like, for example, that one doesn't have hardly any range. Whereas some of these others have quite a, a big range. And so when they sense something, they can basically react by expanding or contracting. Uh, from my perspective, it would be very interesting to learn uh, if, if you can get them uh, an ability to share information and maybe collaborate, maybe coexist. Maybe one, th one thing I was looking at in the future. Um, was the idea of adding a sticky membrane to them. So they might be able to actually stick together or stick to the walls. And, uh, and in addition to that, being able to uh, either um, provide or drain energy from other bubbles they come in contact with. So it might be able to produce kind of a, a larger multi, you know, multi-bubble colony uh -huh. that is able to obtain food or extract it from other bubbles that come across it and then share the food, the energy between them and say the inner bubbles or something like that that don't actually eat themselves, eat, eat any food themselves. I don't know if that will work or not, but that's, that's, yeah, that's an interesting. idea. Yeah. Um, and of course those would be genes, you know, that would probably have a threshold or something like that. And if you had ones that were sticky that would, you know, either stick the walls or to other ones, you might also have ones that, you know, extruded oil or something like that that would you know, make them less likely to be stuck to something else. Yeah, it would, it, it would be interesting to, to see if you find out that there will be some experts in some areas or you will have some parasites or, yeah. Because the whole group, since the individual yeah. would be expanding and attracting the whole kind of group. Yeah. If you get a synergy back. or... Yeah. yeah. I was also thinking about a, having a flagella that would uh, have have a variable efficiency. And it might be able to actually change its... And, and chemotaxis uh, toward toward different types of food. Yeah, that, that's certainly possible. Um, one thing, though, if you have anything like that that's off of one side, I would have to add the physics of rotation to the environment. Right now, they're oh, circular. They do, right. you know, right. very simple impacts. Um, and there's no concept of rotation in it. Mm -hmm. and this would also be a factor if they stuck together. It would be a concept of the yeah. whole body rotating mm -hmm. with impacts. But I've been trying to keep the physics simple by not considering rotation and not and keeping up the fact that they all have the same mass. You know, um, makes it that much easier to do the collisions. Um, let's see. Did, did did it take a lot of tweaking in order to? obtain the stability that we see there? Uh, some. Uh, the amount of food and the number of starting uh, was a big factor. And also, uh, I think, uh, adding the age limit and tweaking what that value was uh, took some time. And a lot of these tweaking values, environmental value, val uh, values, and how the genes are represented in the phenotype of the environment um, are uh, things that I, I would like to eventually have as, as something that the users could um, adjust even on the ongoing simulation. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the maximum um, width and uh, minimum width that expands and contracts between in its normal mode, uh, perhaps that's something that the users can uh, adjust with a slider bar and make much larger bubbles and see how they react in the environment. Would there be fewer of them? Would they just start pushing each other out, you know. Um, 
what what is the, the metabolic cost of different things? You know, um, what's the rate that dropped food comes in? Um, there's a lot of factors that. Um, yeah, it, it looks like they are pretty fast. What what would yeah, they, they, they have? Yeah, they move, and then, and then sometimes they'll, the whole group will slow down again. Yeah, um, so but it, you, you you have a speed limit there? No, there is no, no? speed limit. So so if they the idea is when they their, their normal mode of expanding and contracting. Uh, means that when they hit the wall half the time they're going to be slowing down some, and the other half the time they're going to be speeding up, approximately. But it, but they can also, you know, evolve to always push off from the walls at a, you know, higher rate to make the whole group, you know, move faster. Um, but it also depends on the children because every time they reproduce, the child is bringing a zero momentum mass into the group at that. When one hits th that one, it's going to slow down or actually come to a stop while the child goes off, you know, just because it's an elastic collision. Um, so every new child kind of drains uh, speed from the group. And of course, the dying ones, as long as they re remain, will, will uh, uh, have kind of a constant level of speed added to the group, and then eventually they'll go down to nothing. So, what, um, what what are you planning to do with it? Um, well, I'm uh, going to release this as an open source project, cool. and uh, I'm going to have it on a web uh, a web applet um, on the website. Probably also use WebStar, and maybe just even a direct you know executable or download. Um, so this is going to be an open source project, and I'm hoping to get other people, uh, other developers, and such, uh, um, either working off it or at least being able to use the code to do other projects. Um, beyond that, I don't. I I was kind of wanting to have this uh, remain relatively simple, but I might add some more controls and features that allow the users to play with it more, so they're just not watching it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from default values. I mean, it strikes me as being something that these uh, that high school kids would that are taking biology yeah. would. Uh, it might be know, uh, have a teacher uh, distribute it to interested kids and see what they can do with it. And or even uh, tweak early it programming uh, type classes, because I, I was trying to keep the code very simple and cleanly documented. Uh, What's it written in? Uh, it's written in Java. Java. I also was experimenting with the threading on it. Uh, there's basically, there's a thread representing the pond and the basic physics, you know, of collision between all of the, uh, the bubbles within the pond. And there's, of course, a thread for the view that, you know, will, will show what everything is. Um, but each individual bubble has its own thread that gets spawned that basically all it takes care of is uh, its uh, reaction to stimulus expanding or contracting and also its digestive tract. But, uh, but these, these threads get spawned and then destroyed as the organism dies out. So you have a... It's a very multi-threaded um, application, and it doesn't necess it didn't necessarily have to be programmed this way. You could do it all, you know, with basically one thread. But um, I was just wanting to kind of play with that, and um, and it hasn't really been tweaked for high performance yet. I haven't really tested it out on a lot of slower computers or different types of computers, but I don't expect it to be uh, too bad performance-wise. So it's one one process. So one JVM, JVM that you start, right? One JVM. One process, but that's just once. Okay. Yeah, multiple mm -hmm. threads within the mm -hmm. process. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and, it, and actually the amount of code to produce this was pretty small. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a very large application. But anyway, so that's, that's the bubble pond. And, um, cool. I'm hoping ideas, particularly with like the digestive tract, the, the three types of food, the you know the idea of of uh, simple circular organisms, and also displaying information about each organism as instead of numbers as actual graphical elements on the organism itself. Um, I hope these ideas will be useful um, to other ALAC developers yeah. conceptually. Yeah, very nice. Um, yeah. So, any other questions about it?
No, I was just thinking I was speaking of applications. I don't know if it has to do a lot with biology or you know, how people can, you know, uh, study biology or look at it. Definitely they probably uh, you know you enjoy it. But the thing is I was thinking that uh, if you give, you know, a set of controls to people, they may, you know, compete against each other who spawned will survive longer. So that would be, uh, you exactly. know, yeah. 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 like, you know, yeah. evolve them and then put exactly. them in the same. Exactly. I mean, competitive so. mm. Changing oh, parameters, that's a great allowing, idea. Yes. Well, giving yeah. scales, yeah. Wars. giving yeah. scales Fun where wars. people could change yeah. different right. parameters. That's what I was thinking of, that, of, of that. Um, that could be, you know, just this was inspired most a lot game. by, I remember, uh, an iPhone. An iPhone app, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can make some money with that. <laughs> some money. Just bring two phones together and some of your guys go over to their phones. Oh, that's great. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just a phone call. There's a lot yeah, of possibilities yeah, that can be great. added to this, but I'm, for the most part, I'm trying to keep it uh, as simple as possible so that people, you know, anyone interested in AI, you know, developers, you know, people just interested in it can kind of look at it and see what it's doing. And um, I'm going to have a descriptive page that describes, you know, how, what everything means in it, and then um, anyway, I, I hope it'll be useful and maybe inspire some other people to develop some similar types of projects. Mm -hmm.